Amen. All right, keep your place there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So this morning, we're going to talk about something you're probably not going to hear at too many other churches, maybe not any other churches in, in this area anyway. Um, we're going to talk about um, you know, what God says about how we should look and how men and women should look and how they should look different. Um, you know, you're probably not, this is kind of a counterculture uh, sermon. You know, you're not going to hear too many uh, pastors of churches, especially um, here, talk about these types of things because, you know, they don't want to preach against the culture of the day. We're going to talk about, you know, this, uh, what we're going to talk about today applies to men and women, um, but just because of the way that our culture is today, you're going to see that it definitely applies more uh, to women. So, Let's talk about uh, men and women first. Turn your Bibles to um, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And I first want to, you know, just point out that God um, uses and values both men and women in, in this life. So turn to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we see the, um, we see the disciples at the day of Pentecost. They're speaking in tongues. And God has given them um, the power to prophesy in other languages. That's what tongues mean. They were able to speak in other languages. And this is a prophecy that Peter is talking about. This is a prophecy from the book of Joel being fulfilled. And that's what Peter is talking about in um, verse number 17. And if you look down in Acts chapter 2 in verse number 17, the Bible says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So here you see that when the disciples were prophesying um, in the other languages, there was both men and women um, partaking in this. Okay, this is why, um, you know, while there are different rules for men and women in the church, um, this is why women are all, you know, encouraged to be used of God going out soul winning um, at Verity Baptist Church. Um, it's, it's very biblical. Turn to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. And while you're turning to Acts chapter 18, I'll read for you. Um, well, just go ahead and turn there. You're almost there. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 18, verse 26, um, we see another woman that's being used of God. And the Bible says, And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. So here you see a woman again being um, part of a soul winning experience, explaining the word of God to somebody. In Romans chapter 16, I'll just read it for you, you don't have to turn there. The Bible says, and I commend, Paul is saying, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Cetria that ye receive her in the Lord as become as saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succorer of many and of myself also. Now that word uh, succorer, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, but it means a rescuer, a, sa uh, a saver, someone who helps people recover, um, someone who saves someone from danger, who's helping someone. Um, so, you know, that sounds like a pretty important role to me. You know, so I'm trying, just trying to get you to understand that God has specific roles um, for men and women, and he wants them to have different roles in the family and the church, but God, both men and women are to be used of God in this life. You know, women in Titus chapter 2 and verse 5 are supposed to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. You know, the men are supposed to love their wives, work to support their families, those types of things. And as a matter of fact, like the culture that we're in today, the fact that the, the women's role that I just, just listed for you is, um, is downplayed and, and, and looked down upon by women and men in our culture today is very irritating to me because it is a very important role. And God, God knew the roles that were needed in a family, and he made sure that he filled all the gaps. And I think that raising children and being a mother to children is a very important role. But we see the, all that to say this. You know, we see that you know, women and men both have roles to play with God, but we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if you're still there, and verse number 14 is, is kind of an example of this, 
we see that God wants men and women to look differently. Okay? And if you look down at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, look at verse number 14. The Bible says, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is an example of how God wants men and women to look differently. And it's in the Bible. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 22. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 22. So what we're going to talk about today is dress standards and what Verity Baptist Church... I want to explain to you today the dress standards that Verity Baptist Church um, believes in, and I want to explain to you from the Bible why we believe that. Okay? I, you know, it would be a disservice to you if I said our church believes this, but I didn't explain it to you from the Bible. So that's what I want to do today. I want to go through the Bible, and I want to look at three main points of dress standards. And these apply to men and women, but like I said, with our culture today, it just it, the, this topic kind of hits the women a little bit harder. Okay? So, if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 22, we'll look at the first point. And the first point, it, let's read Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse number 5. The Bible says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. And then we see the other side. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. So here we, say, here we see that there's actually garments that are supposed to be for a man and for a woman. Okay? Now, we saw in 1 Corinthians 11 that you know, God wants men to have short hair and women to have long hair. But here we see that there's a specific garment or garments that the Bible says are for women and for men. And men are not to wear what's for the woman and women are not to wear what's for the men. Now, notice the word that's used here. It's very important. For all that do so are what? You know, the abomination. You know, that is a very, very strong word in the Bible. And if we look at where else that word is used, you know, go to Leviticus 18.22. I just want to give you an example of where this word is used in the Bible and, and the seriousness of that word. Okay? So men and women are to have different clothing, we see in, in Deuteronomy 22 and verse number 5. And if you look at Leviticus 18, 22, another example of um, abomination, the Bible says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. This is talking about, you know, homosexuality. That's, that's abomination. You know, you know how God, how seriously God takes that sin? God uses that same word to talk about the clothing of, you know, men and women together. In Proverbs chapter 6, in verse 16, open your Bible right in the center, you'll be in the book of Psalms. Go one book over and you'll be in the book of Proverbs. We see another example. And I want to show to you, you know, I took you to Leviticus 18 for a reason. I want to show you that there's actually a tie between Deuteronomy 22, verse 5, and Leviticus 18. In Proverbs 6, let's look at another example of the word abomination. Look at verse number 16. These six things doth the Lord hate. So here we see the Lord hates these things. We see the word hate, that the Lord hates it, kind of used in um, uh, conjunction with this word abomination. And he says, Yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord amongst brethren. So look, when the God uses this word abomination, it's serious. You know, he's not, he's, it's, it's a very serious word. So what is the garment? There's a number of different ways to, to prove this and to show this, but I want to show you just from society itself, I want to let you know that even our society itself knows what this garment is, okay? I pulled a, a historical article about, you know, the history of, of, you know, women's clothing and men's clothing in the last hundred years or so, and I just want to read a snippet of that from you, for you. Society, our society especially, has always known what this garment is. And this article from uh, PBS.com or something says this. It says, during World War II, from 1939 to 1945, Pants were more widely worn by civilian and military women 
both at work and socially. They're referring to when women started to wear pants in the United States. Although women continued to enjoy wearing pants after the war, particularly for sports and leisure, style trends for women remained fixated largely on skirts or dresses until the 60s or 70s. Then, buoyed by the women's rights movement, pants became firmly established as popular and appropriate clothing options for women at home, in public, and many workplaces. Now here's something that's interesting. There were actually cross-dressing laws in the United States up until like 1974. Meaning that if you know, a woman was outside the house with you know, a uh, not in a dress wearing pants, that she could actually be arrested. Now I'm not saying that that's you know, the position, but I'm just saying this is where our culture came from and where they are today. The last one was overturned in 1974. And you can read many stories in the early to mid 1900s about women being arrested, you know, for, for going into pu in public with pants, wearing pants, um, you know. But what I would encourage you to do is go look at the pictures of these women and who were, who were you know, leading this charge in our culture today. And what you'll see is because, see, there was no women's pants back in 1910. So you literally had women dressing exactly like a man. Okay, we'll address the women's pants thing here uh, in, on the third point. But you basically, this whole thing was spearheaded by a certain type of woman. Okay, and you look at these women and they're short haired and they're dressing like men. These were, you know, homosexuals largely were driving um, this movement. Okay, so it was not Christian moms pushing um, this movement. Let's put it that way. All right, you say, I, I don't believe you. Well, let me read you the sources for this PBS article that I read. The sources, the, the bibliography at the end of this article, it said that this is, these are the sources that they used. Transgender History by Susan Stryker. And Susan Stryker is like, I think it didn't used to be Susan, let's put it that way. Some kind of, some queer trans, forming something. I'm not even sure what I'm looking at when I looked up Susan Stryker. I quickly closed the, the window. Gay law, challenging the apartheid of the closet. Cross-dressing in the criminal by Bennett Capers. Cross-dressing case for bathroom equality. Does that sound like it's good, going anywhere good? And then transgender history and geography, cross-dressing in context, third volume. This is the, the the people that were driving this cultural change in the United States. And the funny thing is, is that it wasn't that long ago that, you know, if you're a 60 plus year old baby boomer, you remember a time in the United States where women largely um, wore dresses. That's what they wore, skirts. Women did not wear pants in public. And, or, you know, in general, it was just socially, you know, unacceptable. We've, you know, if you're my age, or younger than probably 60 or 65 years old, you don't even remember a time when that was the case. But this is the case. This is another one of those social, um, you know, slopes that we're sliding down. And we shouldn't be any part of it. But I'm gonna show you from the Bible, okay? Now, we see that pants are a man's garment, all right? You say, well, um, what about the men? So let me ask you a question. Halloween is coming up. Halloween is coming up, and when you have a man that wants to be funny and dress like a woman at Halloween, what's he going to wear? He's going to wear a dress. Okay, everybody knows that it's dresses versus pants. Okay, so what's happening today, you know, basically is in the, with women today, what's happening is the equivalent of Christian men walking around wearing dresses. That's basically what you have. Okay, and that's what's going on. When we look at the origins of this movement, we should stay as far away from these type of people as possible, as Christians, okay? So, let's look at point number two. So we see that there's a garment that's for a man and a garment that's for a woman. Even the bathroom signs know what this garment is. We were in Taiwan and we saw a bathroom sign, I have a picture of it somewhere, where it's uh, like, you know, you have the woman with the dress, you know, the little stick figure with the dress, and it's like cut in half, and then you got like the man, you know, just with the pant on one side and the dress on the other side. But that means that anybody can go in that bathroom because this is the bathroom equality movement, right? That, and it's all part of this, okay? Turn to Exodus 28. Let's look at point number two. Exodus chapter 28. 
Point number two is this, that we are to cover our nakedness, both men and women. We are to cover what the Bible calls our nakedness. Now, what is your nakedness? The Bible actually gives very specific instructions to what your nakedness is. And in Exodus 28, verse number 42, the Bible reads, And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. From the loins, even unto the thighs, they shall reach. So the definition of your loins is basically the bottom of your ribs, where your ribs stop, like, you know, your waistline almost. And it's, your loins is, you know, kind of your pelvic area. Obviously, everybody knows this, but even unto the thighs. So your thighs are the upper part of your leg, at the, you know, ending at the knee. So that's what the Bible calls your nakedness. So the Bible says that if you are in short shorts showing your thighs, you are considered showing your nakedness. That's what the Bible says. Now, I believe, now this is kind of Jared's opinion land again, but I believe when the Bible, you know, you could say um, when the Bible calls, you know, someone naked, it could be that they were co uncovering any one of those parts of their body. Okay, turn to John um, 21 and verse 7. And this is my basis for thinking this. So I could basically consider someone who has their thighs uncovered, it would not be a wrong statement for, to, for me to say that they are naked. Okay? Even though that... You know, they're not completely naked, all right? In verse, uh, John verse 20, uh, chapter 21 and verse number 7, we see um, some guys fishing together here, and they see Jesus, and the Bible says, Therefore that disciple who loved Jesus said unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat about, uh, unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. Now I don't think Peter was completely, you know, that would be weird. I think Peter was wearing some kind of, you know, loincloth or something that was not covering him completely as he should have been normally covered because he was out in a boat fishing or whatever and he put a cloak around himself and he dove into the water, okay? But the Bible calls that naked. So the point I'm trying to make is that if you have anywhere from, you know, your, your midriff to your thighs uncovered, you can be considered by the Bible naked, okay? And we are to cover our nakedness, the Bible teaches. All right, now, that pretty much goes against all female attire today during the summer months, basically, in our culture. You know, especially things like swimwear, workout wear, whatever. I mean, look, I would love to join a gym and like have access to all these awesome pieces of equipment and all this kind of stuff, but I just can't do it as a Christian man. It would not be right for me to do it because there's naked people there, see? So everyone's not obviously going to follow these standards, you know, but we need to know what the standards are, all right? So we know what naked means. We know what a man's garment is. You say, okay, but there's women's pants now, all right? Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'm glad you brought that up. You say, before they were wearing man's pants and it was a man's clothing, but now there's women's pants. So let's take a look at that and what the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 2, and let's look at verse number 9. And the Bible here says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. So women, we see, are supposed to dress modestly. Okay, and that, you know, that means that they're supposed to be modest in how they dress. They're not supposed to flaunt, um, you know, riches and, and, and jewelry and everything. And I'm not against jewelry, but I mean over-the-top types things. But the basically, modest apparel, and here's a funny little thing. I accidentally did this. I was, I was writing this, um, this sermon, and I had my cursor in the Google search bar, and instead of on my Word document, and I typed in modest apparel, and I hit return. Search uh, modest apparel on Google. Even Google understands what modest apparel is. Up pops um, on all the tabs, shopping, um, all, whatever. It's all these women in these long, uh, you know, dresses. There's not one woman in pants when you, when you Google modest apparel. Isn't that funny that even Google understands that? You know, the wicked company Google understands what modest apparel is. So <laughs> look, you know, 
don't, don't rule your life by what Google says, okay? I'm just, that was just an interesting thing that I did. Um, look, they're, they're basically all women in dresses below the knee. You don't even see anyone in, in short dresses when you do that, that little test, all right? So you say that there's women's pants now. None of them are modest. We all know this is true, and you know this is true. Basically, all women's pants are basically, you know, yoga pants. They're skin-tight pants. They're not modest. It's, it's totally immodest. So you lose either way. When you're looking at what the Bible actually says, you know, you have to cover your nakedness, you have to wear a woman's garment, and you have to be modest. That pretty much rules out, you know, a woman wearing pants and a man, just like it rules out a man wearing a dress. It's pretty much the same thing. Okay? I'm actually, uh, you know, a little bit surprised that women and, and girls today are comfortable walking around in what they're walking around in. It's, it's a little bit surprising to me. Um, because I know how my family dresses, and it's just, um, it, it's pretty bold. It's getting, it's getting bolder, it seems like. Now, so we see those three things. We see that there's a woman's um, garment, there's a man's garment. We see that we're to cover our nakedness, and we see that we're to be modest. And this goes for men, too. But men just generally don't, you know, I mean, Christian men, I should say. Um, I, I told my wife, I've said this to my wife several times, when you go to San Francisco to the airport or something like that, the day is coming where men will be wearing yoga pants. And I, I'm sad to report that, but it's coming. I mean, it's, uh, what I'm talking about is Christian men, de you know, certainly at this point don't struggle in these types of areas as much, okay? So let me just talk about situational ethics, okay? So now we see those three things, and let me talk about situational ethics, because we also don't believe in situational ethics at Verity Baptist Church, because it's not found in the Bible. And what do I mean by situational e e ethics? Would it be, here, here's an example, would it be socially acceptable today for a woman to walk around in downtown Fresno in her underwear? No. Yet, if she's located at a beach or somewhere where there's water or a swimming pool, it's totally fine, right? That's situational ethics, that in this case it's okay, but in this case it's not, okay? If it's wrong in one place, it's wrong everywhere. Let me read for you Exodus 28, 42 again. And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. From the loins even unto the thighs they shall reach, unless you're at the beach or the gym or at summertime in Central Valley, California. No. It's all the time. So we don't believe in situational ethics. If it's not modest, it's not modest anywhere. If it's nakedness, it's nakedness everywhere. And if it's an abomination, it's an abomination everywhere. Okay? So we don't believe in situational ethics. And we've been kind of programmed in this country to accept, you know, situational ethics in, in, the, in the, the, the popular culture out there. That's what we're programmed to accept. So let me just say this. this what I'm explaining to you today, you know, this is Verity Baptist Church's you know, this is our position that we take on this issue, okay? That's why I'm preaching the sermon this morning, so you can see why we take this position, where in the Bible we see, you know, these three points that lead us to this conclusion, that ladies should dress in dresses, they should dress modestly, and that they should not uncover their nakedness, nor should, should men. But I understand you know, that, you know, if you, you're, you're sitting here today and you're like, you're that church-only dress lady, you know, so let me just first say this, you know, we appreciate you, you know, you know, conforming to our standards when you come here. We, you know, we appreciate that. And, you know, because this is really a personal issue, right? This is a personal issue that's between you and God. But here's the thing. If you are that lady, if you are that lady, we appreciate you understanding our position on this and why we take that position. But if you are that lady... You know, just let me ask you a question. You know, God sees you at the grocery store. You know, God sees you, you know, at your home. You know, you do have an inconsistency there. And so that's something to think about. Now, I actually have a, a pretty strong, we actually have a pretty strong personal perspective on this issue. And I want to share that with you. 
And my wife doesn't want me to share that with you, but I'm going to share it with you. I interrogated my wife this week, okay? I talked to her, and I knew, you know, what we went through and when we went through things, but I just, like, I really wanted to understand her path through this issue, and I really learned some, some new things this week, um, some depth. So, you know, guys, you should talk to your wives often. Because I, I, I just, every single time that I sit down and I have a conversation with my wife, this is, I just, it brings us closer together, and I, I just learn so many new things about her and about us and about our family. So take some time to talk to your wives. That's a little, little sidebar. But I identified, you know, three areas that I want to share with you that because my wife went through this, where we, you know, started, we left the Lutheran church, I got saved, she was already saved, but then we went to, started going to a Baptist church that had these biblical standards. And my wife wore pants, and I didn't even have a problem with her wearing pants. I wasn't, I wasn't there. I wasn't there. And, but, you know, as soon as we went to the Baptist church, you know, my wife, in order to not be um, a cause of offense or, you know, a stumbling block to anyone, she wore dresses to church, you know, like, you know, most people will. And, you know, she came to that conclusion before I did. That, you know what, this isn't right. I need to change. And when I was talking to her about, you know, hey, how did that go? What was the hardest thing about that? The hardest thing for her was the social aspect of it. There's a social stigma on it, especially where we're from. We're not from a big city where you can kind of see, you know, we're out on a farm in the middle of nowhere. Everybody in North Dakota pretty much dresses the same. And the women's situation, clothing situation in North Dakota, let me just put it this way. We used to make a joke that in North Dakota, the men are the men, the men are men, and so are the women. We used to joke about that since I was a kid. Because you'll see women on farms, and they're just like, they dress like the men, they look like the men, they act like the men, you know? And uh, so there's a social aspect to it. So my wife's on a farm. She decides, you know what? I'm just, I'm, I've got an inconsistency here. I'm getting rid of it. She threw away all her pants. I'm like, man, maybe you should sell them to somebody. But she's like, that wouldn't be right. <laughs> so we did. she threw them all away, and she started wearing, wearing dresses. But that... The funny thing is that second time that you show up at a social activity and you and your daughter are wearing dresses, you know, people are like, what has happened? You know, have, are you in a cult? You know, this is the kind of reaction that, you know, people get concerned about because you're trying to get that thing right in your life. But look, it's situational ethics. You know, we, we knew it wasn't right. She knew it wasn't right. She got it right. And, you know, she... She's in a place where nobody else was like her. And that takes a little bit of strength to do that. Okay? To just say, you know what? I know, look, men have those types of struggles in their lives too, where men are going to have to be like, you know what? The culture says this. You know, everybody at work goes out after work and all this kind of stuff, and they go to the gym, and they do these things. We're all going to have to take our stands in our life, whether we're men or women. This is just one that right now in our society, the women just have to take the stand. It's a stand that they have to take. It's a fight that's in front of them right now. But it's a fight that should be fought. Okay? So there's a social aspect of it when I was talking to Heidi about it this week. And one thing that really came up for me, though, with talking to Heidi, she said, she really explained to me what a heart issue it was for her. And I'm not going to say too much about this. If you have questions, just go talk to her about it. But... It was, she said it was an idol in her life. And you say idol, you know, what, what do you mean idol? And that's what I asked her, what do you mean idol? And she's like, well, it was, it was something that I knew the Bible was clear on, that I knew what was right, and I was just hanging on to it, and I was knowingly not doing what I knew I should be doing. And you know, we can have all kinds of different idols in our life, of things that we know are against what the Bible says, but we hang on to. You know, music, uh, we talked about TV, um, what we're letting into our home. All these things can become idols in our life. And, you know, another thing my wife brought up is she just said, you know what, when I let go of that idol, it was like, it was like the last thing, the major thing I was hanging on to. She, she said, you know what, our, our family really changed after that. And I said, I said, really? 
And then we talked about when she had done that. We kind of we recapped the, the history of when that happened and then just how things started moving in our lives. And she's right. It, it, you know, God started working overtime in our lives you know, around that time. And you know, I had idols I was giving up. She had idols she was giving up. But we were changing our lives. And this was something that it was an idol for her. So basically, anything in your life that is keeping you from trusting the Word of God is an idol in your life. You know, where you're, you can't just put your trust on, you know what, the Bible says that. That's just what I'm going to do. You know, that's, that becomes an idol. And it hold, it'll hold you back in your Christian life. Okay? The third thing is this. And this is, my, this is my point. Those were Heidi, Heidi's things, but this is, this is something that I think about and I want you to think about too. Turn to Psalm uh, 16. And this is something I think about all the time. And the, the, the third thing I want to say on this is you need to start thinking about what you want to pass on to the next generation. Okay? And you need to, if you're a parent today and you're sitting here listening to this, you need to take this seriously and you need to think about this often, about what you want to pass on to the next generation. Because if your kids see you some way at church and they see you another way at home, you are sending a very clear message to your kids. I mean, the way I look at it, the way I look at it is, look, my kids are going to go through, we talked about this cultural slide that we're in right now. What my kids are going to see in their life is going to be much worse than what I will see in my life. So my thought on this is that I want to right the ship in my family. I want to right the ship. And you know what? It's hard to right the ship. Because people will be against you. This is just one example, this dress standard thing. When you say, you know what, we're changing our life in this area, we're changing our life in this area, we're changing our life in this area, people will fight that. And you will be surprised at how much influence people in your life think they have over you when those situations come about. But my theory on this is I need to right this ship. I need to take the steering wheel, I need to turn it and it's hard to turn. But I'm going to get that ship pointed in the right direction. And then when my kids grow up and my kids start raising kids, that sh all they have to do is, is keep the course. It's easier to keep the course than it is to turn a huge ship. So I want to do the heavy lifting for them. That's what I want to do. That's one of the main goals of my life is to, to right the ship and get, keep it going in the right direction so my kids can not only have it pointed in the right direction, but see an example of someone sailing in the right direction. And if your kids see you, what have I said over and over again? What you do is more important than what you say. And kids have like hypocrisy detectors. They can just tell when they're just the smallest kids. Five, six years old, they, they, they can see hypocrisy like like nobody else. It's super important. Did you turn to Psalm 16? This is one of the goals of my life, and you should make it one of the goals of your life as well. Look at Psalm 16, verse number 6. I want my kids to be able to say this. When I'm dead and my grandkids are looking through a scrapbook and they see their, you know, their grandfather or their great-grandfather, whoever, I want them to look down and I want them to say, the lines are falling unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. That's more important than money or land or anything I could ever give to my kids, is leaving them a goodly heritage, leaving them a, a ship that's sailing in the right direction, that I've shown them how to sail you got to go this way, and here's how it works, and here's what you do, because they saw me doing it. So just think about when you're in these situational situations, situational situations, we're in the, when you have these idols in your life, your, your kids will see that. You're sending a clear message there. Okay? So, 
you know, look, we love you all. And, you know, we're, we're, I'm here to tell you today what the, the, the stance of our church is and why it is that way. And like I said, if, if you have, you know, if you're not, you know, where we are, um, I, I'm trying to encourage you of what the Bible says. Um, and I'm trying to encourage you to, to get that ship righted in the right direction. Um, but, you know, we appreciate the fact that, you know, you're... You know, even if you are that situational person right now, we appreciate the fact that you're, um, you know, dressing the way you do, even if it's just at church, you know. So there, there's, there's positive there as well. But I want you to think about today, just men and women. I, wanted you to, I want you to know where, where this culture came from that we're dealing with today, how we got where we are today. It came from nowhere good. And I'm telling you, it's headed nowhere good. I don't know what you know, women in this country and men in this country, for, uh, you know, will be wearing in 20 years, but I can't even imagine with the way it's going right now. And we should have no part of that. Just like the bulletin says, we should be a peculiar people. Amen. People should be able to look at you. Oh, here's another one. I have actually had, I have given the gospel to people and gotten people to church just because my daughter and wife were at the house in a dress. I've been given examples, and I think my wife probably has too. Because she wears a dress and she looks peculiar, she looks different, I've had contractors at my house come off the roof and say, where do you guys go to church? And it strikes up a conversation where you're able to give the gospel to somebody. Amen. I mean, we are to, people are to look at us and say, you know what, they're different. Men too. I didn't have to go to work at this new job very long before people knew that I was different. Because we should be peculiar to people. Why don't you swear every third word? That's peculiar. Why don't you go out to all the parties that are happening all the time? Don't you like fun? That's peculiar. People should be able to look at us, see how we act, and how we dress. The Bible says. Look, the Bible brings it up. The Bible brings up your clothing. It's important. If, the, if it's in the Bible, it's important. So men and women, just both of you today, just think about where, where are these idols in your life? Think about it. Think about it uh, aside, outside of clothing standards everywhere. Where are these idols? What are you hanging on to? You know, what are your hang-ups? Get rid of them, and they'll help you move forward. Just like we talked about a couple weeks ago on, you know, what's the limits of your faith? It's limiting your faith. It's limiting your growth. Get rid of your hang-ups. They're holding you back. Okay? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Uh, we thank you for all these people. Lord, we ask that you, uh, you bless uh, the rest of the day, bless the soul winning, uh, bless uh, pastors' um, travels down here, Lord, and uh, bring us all safely back to church this evening. In Jesus' name, amen.